Forgiveness can be the most imaginative way of becoming free and offering freedom. It seems to involve giving up all hope of a better past. For me, freedom is ultimately a state of mind, a state of being, which allows us to be fully alive in the present moment, to be free to give and receive love, to be healed of all that keeps us from being naturally true, naturally compassionate and fulfilled. It can't be willed, but we can line ourselves up for it with intention and humility. And we have to face what's in the way. There is a Greek word, soteria, which means to have a big heart, to breathe deeply, to be free, to be in full health. It is the word that was used to mean salvation in the New Testament. How can we be saved from our deluded, destructive, frozen stories? How can we move from stories that harm towards stories that heal? Sometimes words die. For me, forgiveness and sin have been difficult words, let alone the word God. They had become encrusted, barnacled by eons of piety and had lost their original roots, their sense, their meaning. But part of my journey towards freedom has been to reclaim these words, to become less prejudiced towards them, to be able to say them and feel their meaning, to be moved by them, to know them within myself. Writing has become a way of allowing myself time to unthaw, to allow the right words to come, but also to accept that there were days when there were no words and the sky was dark. I have often felt that I was risking the disintegration of myself without the assurance that a new whole would emerge. It required solitude and silence, a prayerful, disciplined, patient, watchful stance, a deep listening. It helped me to trust the creative process. It has been thrilling to come to appreciate that the poetic is often vitally important in the language of restoration and forgiveness. There seems to be an intense need to get to the bare roots of words, to refine, to redefine the vocabulary of restoration. My sister Lucy wrote poetry and prisoners have written poetry for the first time in response to our story. Poetry raises the register, speaks words of grace, and the word was made flesh. One of Canon David Self's definitions of sin which resonates with me is, Sin is a proud claim to be self-sufficient in life, claiming a total freedom for ourselves and the way we live. Yes, I have lived this selfish, hedonistic kind of freedom in my early adulthood and know the harm and destruction that it sows and reaps. I still live with the consequences known and unknown. It is not possible to change the actions of the past, but it is possible to experience that forgiveness can mean giving up or hope of a better past. 44 years ago, in 1973, Lucy was 21 and I was 25, and we both were both in our final year of studying English literature at university. Lucy was scholarly, religious, literary, and chaste. She had kindness, sensitivity, humor, warmth, wit, and a piercing intelligence. She claimed to do the opposite of those around her, mostly me. We loved T.S. Eliot's The Four Quartets and used to muse upon the phrase, 
the point of the intersection of the timeless with time. Here we are akin. We gathered for Christmas with my mother. Five weeks earlier, Lucy had chosen to be received into the Catholic Church. We came from an agnostic background. On the 27th of December, she went to visit her friend Helen in Cheltenham. In her bag, she had a letter of application to post to the Courtauld Institute, where she had hoped to do a postgraduate study in medieval art. And she also had a medieval text, a dream vision called Pearl. This book helped me to find a shape for my book eventually. Lucy left Helen's house to catch the last bus home. She was never seen again. There began the excruciating long years of not knowing, the frozen silence where words could not be uttered. This is not to say that those words, those years were divide of, devoid of love, joy, growth and giving birth but that there was a deep layer of unresolved, unspoken, unfelt pain for which there was no words. It had almost become taboo to talk about Lucy as the years went by. There was an increasing fear that we would all die and never know what had happened to her. A void, avoidance, a void dance, hopping on one leg. But in the year of Lucy's disappearance, I also received a glimpse of the shining silence. It came as a dream. In the dream, Lucy came back and I asked her where she had been. She replied, I have been sitting in a water meadow. Then with a smile, she said, if you sit very still, you can hear the sun move. This image filled me with a profound feeling of peace, the kind that passeth understanding. It has re remained deeply significant and real. In January 1994, I became a member of the Religious Society of Friends, a Quaker. Our worship is a silent waiting on God with occasional ministry. Around 1650, the founder, George Fox, exhorted, rend all veils and discern all deceit that the pure may come to life. Five weeks later, we began to hear news of bodies being dug up in the garden of 25 Cromwell Street, Gloucester. On March the 4th, Lucy's birthday, Fred West told the police that there were more bodies in the basement and that one of them was called Lucy. The shock, numbness and denial began to invade. I lit a candle and prayed that something good could come out of this, something that we could learn from. I went outside into the dark and cried out, please don't let me have to go through this on my own. But Lucy did. I pray that she was in a state of grace. Could she pray? Survivor's guilt is dangerous. Lucy's new label as West victim didn't feel right. I felt it was vital to reclaim her from the West and the media as my sister and to write about the beauty and aspirations of her life without denying the reality of her excruciating physical violation and demoli demolition. She was abducted, gagged, raped, tortured and murdered. She was beheaded, dismembered and buried in a hole with leaking sewage pipes in the basement. I needed to rehumanize her to salvage the sacred. The American poet Gary Snyder wrote a definition of sacred. That which helps take us out of our little selves into the larger self of the whole universe. 
Then I received the second dream. In the dream, the pathologist pointed to a pink sack in the corner. It was full of numbered bones, which assembled themselves into a full-size skeleton. As I embraced the bones, they became Lucy in flesh, and I remembered what she was like to hold. The next morning, I wondered where her bones were. They were being kept for an exhibit for the defense, and we still couldn't have a funeral. I felt the need for this to become real. The police enabled this to happen. I went with two friends to a chapel of rest in Cardiff. Inside the full-size coffin were two boxes. As we drew nearer, I lifted the lid of the smaller box and a feeling of strength came over me. I gasped at the beauty of her skull, which shone like burnished gold. I lifted it with great care and tenderness and kissed her brow. Later that year, I attended a silent seven-day Chan Chinese Zen Buddhist retreat. On the fourth day, I saw clearly that there were four ways of dealing with the unthawing, unresolved pain. I could dump it on others. The extreme expression of this would be murder. Let it corrode and corrupt me. The extreme expression of this would be suicide. Try to deny it and carry on as if nothing had happened, which wasn't possible. But then I saw that the most creative, imaginative way forward would be to move towards forgiveness, but I had no idea how this could happen, only that it offered hope, healing and mystery. I made a vow to try and forgive the West. But when I came home from the retreat, I had an overwhelming physical experience of murderous rage. At that moment, I was capable of killing. In other words, I was not so separate from the Wests. I saw within my heart the huge capacity for destruction, for evil. This was the first step towards connecting with the Wests as human beings the first step towards forgiveness. There is a place deep within that knows that violence can only breed more violence, and this is where it must stop. The rawness of the wound stripped away all that is unimportant, the deepest reality of what it means to be human was laid bare. In the shattering, I yearned for healing. I was alive in a way that I had never been alive before, alive to human possibilities, divine possibilities. It says, just wait, stay with the pain, let it burn you into a place of renewal. Stay true to what is actually happening, Avoid nothing. That's where the teaching seems to be. I attended the committal trial for Rosemary West. It was hard to connect her with the endless graphic details of sexual depravities and brutality that were read out hour after hour for five days by a barrister. But when I heard her voice on the tape recordings during the police interviews, I began to get a picture of her. I tried to imagine growing up in an environment where fear and abuse were the main components. Her behavior was best bestial and brutal in its attempt to make her victims experience a feeling of extreme pain, humiliation and impotence. I began to imagine that perhaps she had been subjected to these experiences in the past. There was one little glimmer of insight into her imagination that both touched my heart and disturbed me. 
It was her attempt to lure another victim, Alison Chambers, to come and live in Cromwell Street by promising her a life in the country at the weekends on their farm where she could be able to ride horses and write poetry. I began to sweat. This was Lucy's world. I learnt that they had been brutalised in their childhoods by sexual abuse, violence and neglect. I soon got the feeling that Rosemary's dev deviant ignorance sprang from the fact that she had rarely known beauty, truth or love. I began to understand her need to have absolute control, the deep violent rage of impotence and ignorance. This is not to forgive her actions, but to realize that when you are brutalized, you lose a sense of value, the beauty, the sacredness of the gift of your life. You become disconnected from the source of your being. I was learning how to find compassion for myself and to believe that others can forgive me. I was exploring my own rotting pile of mistakes and seeing that it was also my compost that had meaning, that it doesn't have to remain repulsive, something I can't acknowledge, something I want to edit out. It is actually part of who I have been and I have to develop another relationship with it. I realized my own deep need for forgiveness and how that led me to moments of compassion for the Wests. In the year 2000, my inner journey led to a moment of authentic compassion for Rosemary West, again towards the end of a Chan retreat. I was struggling and despairing of ever being free. In an interview with Chan Master Sheng Yen, he said softly, just know that your suffering is helping to relieve the suffering of others. I returned to my cushion to sitting very still. I thought of Rosemary West. Her moral lens was utterly distorted by years of sexual abuse by her brother and father. She had been abducted from a bus stop and raped when she was 15. She was 19 years old when she and Fred abducted Lucy from a bus stop. In my mind, I said half-heartedly, I hope that my pain might help you in some way. Then, the most profound realization of the depth and extent of her suffering that she has created for herself and so many others was revealed. In that moment, my heart was awakened. There was a felt, embodied saturation of comprehending. I saw the complex cage of her fear, rage, shame, guilt, and unresolved grief. Then there was the reality of being locked away until she dies, being hated and demonized by our society and by fellow prisoners, her family being wrecked and fragmented. There was a searing feeling of her isolation and shame. In that moment, my own deepest shame surfaced again and was faced. In that po moment, my pain went away. The word forgiving became alive. Forgiving. Blame, I am feeling this pain because of you, changed to freedom. My pain is suffered aloud for you that you may be free of whatever caused you to harm in the first place. The unexpected byproduct of this empathy with her suffering was a feeling of being freed, being more alive, released in some way. I feel a deep need not to write people off not to demonize them. I feel a need to find a way of somehow embracing, bringing into love 
people who have excluded themselves in many ways by their violent, atrocious actions. This feeling has grown through my restorative justice work in pr many prisons over the years. This work was unexpected. It was as if there was an outer shape for my inner experience. In 2004, the first exhibition of the Fig Forgiveness Project opened in the OXO Gallery. The stories had been collected by the founder, Marina Cantacuzino. The exhibition is called The F Word. Some of us met in a cafe next door and realized that we had all been treading a rather lonely, treacherous path, but we could now rejoice in the birth of a joining up of purpose. I have been privileged to work in prisons for the last 10 years with our program Restore. We use stories from victims and perpetrators to explore the limits and possibilities of forgiveness, considering alternatives to resentment, retaliation and revenge. Each story expresses the cost and gift of this process. The participants tell their stories in response. The work is something about undoing labels and finding the embrace of a shared humanity. More recently, we began to work with women in Eastwood Park Prison. It was in a creative writing <coughs> follow-on day that I found myself working with Lisa who was unable to start. I sat by her and she pointed to a picture of a seashore. Touching on the horizon, she said, that makes me feel weird. Then she began to write about a walk on a beach. The next part of the exercise was to write, I am in front of the phrases, then to write down what they felt that they were not then blend them together. Here is Lisa's poem. I am the waves crashing against the rocks. I am the sound of birds, but I am not free. I am the feel of the sand and the shells. I am not on drink. I am the nice clear blue water. I am not just a nasty person. I am the horizon. In 2004, I wrote Rosemary West a letter here is an extract. Please know that I do not feel any hostility towards you, just a sadness, a deep sadness that all this happened. Our lives are connected. May you be less burdened by fear. I sent it four years later when I felt that I did not expect a reply. She did not reply, and it was requested that I made no further correspondence. Once in prison, a man was gazing at a little woven bag made for me by Lucy when she was eight years old. I've used this bag in my work in prisons for some years, passing it round when I'm speaking of Lucy. The man said that he saw light shining from it and that he didn't usually have experiences like that. His name is Peter Wolfe and is one of the, our storytellers speaking from a reformed perpetrator perspective. We have since worked together for many years. I told him that Lucy's name means light. I feel deep gratitude for the love and grace that nourishes and upholds this continuing journey. I have tried to keep an open heart, 
and not turn away. And why would I want to do that? It is because I have experienced the sacredness of my own life. And in that realization, nobody can be excluded. Let me end with one of Lucy's poems. She always was more succinct than I. Thank you, Lucy. Your life and death have deepened my knowledge of love. I will try to pass that on. Things are as big as you make them. I can fill a whole body, a whole day of life with worry about a few words on one scrap of paper. And yet, the same evening, looking up, can frame my fingers to fit the sky in my cupped hands.